This is South Asia Matters, a brand new podcast on the brand new website called Ava South Asia. And I'm today with Swarnim Wagle in Colombo. There is the Indian Ocean lapping on the shores just in front of my room. I'll show it to you in a second. Uh, but Swarnim is, of course, a well, very well-known economist and a politician of the Rashtri Swatantrata Party in Nepal. We are on the Taj Samudra, which evidently is owned by a Nepali businessman. I'm told that, yeah. yeah. And, uh, of course, the Taj is an iconic Indian hotel chain, but if it's owned by a Nepali businessman, then we're already in one South Asia. But Swarni, welcome so much to Ava South Asia. Pleasure to be with you. This is a brand new website, a web platform. Uh, And I'm going to ask you, as a Nepali economist politician, uh, first of all, congratulations on your election. But what is the, for you as a Nepali, what does it mean to be South Asian? Are you South Asian? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, uh, Nepal is slightly different from the rest of South Asia in the sense that we were never colonized. Mm-hmm. Uh, however, uh, there was this engagement way back uh, from the British uh, days, 1816. There was an Anglo-Nepal actually war, okay. uh, after which you know the, the regime of the day uh, opted for a policy of coexistence and all that. And then after Indian independence and the British left the subcontinent, yeah. uh, you know, it's, it's, it's been a, there's been a shift. But uh, we are we share the same uh, ecology, uh, similar languages, similar religious. Um, cultural heritage, so we are uh, part of South Asia. You know, you've talked a lot about the uh, the demography of Nepal, how your very small population is a very young one. Tell us a little bit about Well, that. small only relative to India and China. Well, absolutely. If yeah. we were in the European Union, it would be the seventh largest uh, country in the European Good Union. Good Lord. You know, so it's 30 million. Uh, but you're absolutely right. Uh, half the country is under the age of 25. Just think about that, right? Half the country. And But the world is fast uh, aging. Uh, India, I think the median age is around 29, 30. China is 38. Japan is in the late 40s. China is 38. Yeah, yeah, it's already aged. Uh, so what that implies is for countries that are still very poor and are trying to catch up fast mm-hmm. in terms of per capita income, the demographic window is very small, right? So this is why the urgency of political economic reforms and get the governance going to make that rapidly. There are some countries in East Asia have shown that it can be done within a generation or two. The West obviously took uh, about two centuries, right? Uh, you know, they started this modern economic growth uh, process after the Industrial Revolution. Mm-hmm. But countries that have really caught up uh, have done it uh, by marrying it with this demographic influx. And that has to be in tandem with the economic reforms. And this, some of the economic dynamism that we saw in India, for example, also, you know, reforms, that demographic burst, that hunger for catch up, you know, when when it all comes together, then you, you tend to make that leap. You think, you, you, you think that's happening in Nepal? Because, you know, you're now part of the <laughs> Rashtri Swatantrata Party. You broke away from the Nepali Congress, which is one of Nepal's oldest political parties. And let me tell you, I'm all in favor of traditional <laughs> political parties. I mean, the RSP, RSP is doing really well. You guys did really well in the elections last year and as well as in the by-elections this year. So how do you sort of cohere it's a the politics story. with... Yeah. Yeah, with it's, the, it's the demographic story, uh, it's the diaspora story. Diaspora story. The diaspora, absolutely. So folks uh, have had to leave the country in big numbers. Um, uh, looking for work abroad. Looking for work abroad because economically we've stagnated, right? Nepal okay. has made amazing social and political advances. Mm-hmm. We're very proud of uh, our uh, social political advances, but economically we're a laggard. We're an absolute laggard. Other than Afghanistan, we're the poorest country in the, in the entire continent of Asia not just South Asia. Mm-hmm. And uh, so what that meant is economically we're, uh, you know, we're really, really behind. And and think of the, that demographic first, half a million coming into the workforce every year. Mm-hmm. Where are the jobs? Very few. Hence, mm-hmm. the push factor as well as the demand on the other side, the Gulf countries, Malaysia, Korea, you know, looking for uh, low paying, uh, semi-skilled, highly disciplined mm-hmm. workforce have tapped to the Nepali market. And We've supplied that, right? The demographic window comes in. Ideally, we would have had generated economic opportunities within Nepal, right? So that many of these folks would have stayed uh, in the country and developed Nepal. So, where is the diaspora of, uh, going? Is it going to the Gulf? Is it going to Europe? The temporary the migrants all to the Gulf, and okay. they they've tended to come back you know, after a, after a few years. The permanent migrants, which is now increasing in numbers, the United States, uh, Europe, Australia, huge numbers. Uh, and partly uh, East Asia, but East Asia is still quite hostile to permanent aliens. So, so these temporary migrants, for example, in the Gulf, they're competing with other migrants from India, uh, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh. So how does that, I mean, how do you look at that? Well, there seems to be, and you know, the, the, the demand seems to be almost unlimited uh, in the sense that there's a, there appears to be, I don't know if somebody has done a proper study on this, but there's a division of labor there, mm-hmm. right? The Filipinos, for example, are on top of the heat. On top of the heat. Kerala uh, folks are doing uh, special tenders, specialize in some some aspects of the uh, the, the professions. The Bangladeshis and the Nepalis, I see, you see them uh, a lot in Qatar Airport, for example. From Qatar, well, they built the football stadium. Lot of the uh, so uh, 
we tend to be on the semi to unskilled uh, segments, I think. Now, uh, can you cohere with me this, uh, this boom, this uh, migration boom, plus the, the social political changes that are taking place inside Nepal? Yeah, so folks, even if they were not terribly sophisticated in their educational upbringing, etc., they've seen the world now, right? Mm -hmm. uh, even folks who you know, remain behind in Nepal are hyper-connected to what's going on in the U.S., in India, in China, everywhere. So that progress that they've seen elsewhere, they ask, why not here? You know, why are we uh, so far behind? And look at this, you know, this corrupt plot that, that is really uh, Which corrupt discovered, plot? miscovered. The old guard, the old guard, you know, the political guard, uh, you know, the ones who are running the country for the last 30 years. Um, so they, they've begun to ask that question. And this young folks may not even be sentimentally attached mm -hmm. to a lot of the democratic struggles that the current guard actually started their career with, for which folks like us give them due credit. It's, our argument is they've stayed, uh, you know, uh, past the, what, what do you say, welcome date or whatever, you know, uh, they've uh, overextended their welcome. Um, and, and now it's, you know, terrible misgovernance, and which is resulting in this economic stagnation, uh, these corruption scandals almost every day, and this culture of impunity, nobody goes to prison because all the political institutions have been captured, constitutional bodies, you know, that separation of power is no longer there. So that frustration is now, because information is so readily available, and you see how other countries that have leapt ahead have done it. Right? Even India, you know, uh, over the last 20 years, you know, amazing progress. No, we've got the Amadi Party, but that's increasingly becoming like a traditional pol political party, right? Where the focus is around one or two leaders. So how is the RSP, the Rashtriya Swatantrata Party, well, We party, don't compare ourselves with, uh, with uh, Amadi. It's yeah. two different parties. I mean, uh, Absolutely. Amadi, much larger theater in India, you know, Delhi, Delhi alone is 30 million, and, right? And now Nepal, Punjab. And now Punjab. Ours is already a national uh, party uh, in the sense that we are nationally defined. Uh, we, we got, uh, what, what is it, 9 to 10 percent of the votes in, in the first uh, first round, 21 seats uh, in, the, in the House of Parliament. So already a national party um, with the all country presence. And, um, and we're hoping uh, that this hunger for change, frustration with the old guard uh, will uh, really uh, push us. Uh, Give us the opportunity to reform, make these reforms that we want. So, Ravi Lamichani, your leader, was forced to uh, to exit the party because he evidently has an uh, an American passport, and either he didn't realize oh, no. it or he didn't apply <laughs> for the party. He's citizenship. very much the president of our party. Okay, and he has an exit in the party. He exited the government after the government. Days. That's right. He was a deputy deputy prime minister. He was deputy prime minister um, on a technicality. I mean, there was some issue. He had already given up his American uh, citizenship and passport, but he hadn't provided the Nepali the, documents. The, the notification to a concerned authority. So it was a technicality which he remedied and then he fought the election again, uh, one with even larger margin the next round, the next round and then he's very much at his now. Very charismatic uh, former journalist and former sort of a singer, right? Yeah, yeah. With, a, with a you know pulse for, uh, for what the needs of the people are. And at times when the state has been absent, you know, recently there was a, there was a crisis in Israel, for example. So he's, as, even as a media person, he, he had one feet in the humanitarian domain. Right? In so what way? So f when, you know, Nepali states didn't, institutions didn't function. So he was rescuing people, for example, from the Gulf, you know, people in trouble. Uh, they would turn to him. During and, this crisis? Oh, for the last 10 years. Right? So he has a huge following among the migrant workers, for example, the diaspora. Okay. We've lost faith in the formal institutions of, of the Nepali state. And they've turned to non-governmental organizations or charismatic individuals with some influence, like uh, Ravi Lani Chaniji, you know. So I think that gave him that base. And he realized, you know, if I can do so much good through the media, why not make the ultimate plunge into politics where I would be able to do much more? Uh, and I think that was his motivation of, uh, of coming into politics. So somebody like you, Swarnam, you're an economist. You also made the plunge into politics. So at the end of the day, it's politics that drives change. But you are spurning politics, right? So, I mean, this contradiction, explain this to me. No, no, I, I, uh, it can be a very noble prof profession, right? Absolutely. Even in Nepal. You know, uh, some even in Nepal, you can't <laughs> say that. No, you Listen, know, it's the I, old guard that's, that no, no, gave you your Nepal, constitution, no, no, no. that did away with the monarchy. No, I've appreciated that, I just did, right? But even, talk uh, about it a little no, bit more. No, even in Nepal, uh, my role model is a politician, BP Koirala. You know? So I want to take the new generation Nepalis to follow the ideals and the dreams and the aspirations that somebody like BP Koirala embodied in the 50s and the 60s. You know, Even at very low levels of income, you can be a brutal, vibrant democracy and yet aspire for modernity, right? So you can. You can. And he showed that. He, in he, the 50s. He had a very brief tenure, 17 months, mm -hmm. before the king uh, locked him up uh, in prison uh, without king, trial. King for Mahindra. Years, king Mahindra. And then he had to go to exile in India for another eight years, right? 
uh, but he was a renaissance man in Nepal, you know, way ahead of his times. And uh, some of the vision that he had 50, 60 years ago, we're trying to implement just now. So in that sense, even you know, my dream idol person, Bipi Koirala, was a politician. Right? Right. It just, and many, I don't, I don't want to go into names, but yeah. many of them started with that early idealism. But somehow along the way, they've lost that gym, they've become corrupt, they've become inept. Now the whole quest is to hang on, uh, partly to keep amassing uh, sort of illicit wealth, but also to then protect themselves, and mm -hmm. hence the capture of all the institutions and the weakening of our democratic um, sort of fabric. So you, you remain an economist, but you also are a politician, so you ma you're able to manage both? I, I'm a trained economist. I studied at the LSE, Harvard, ANU. I met the president of Sri Lanka here, where I was actually presenting him a paper on the Sri Lankan economic crisis mm -hmm. that I co-authored with a professor from Australia, Premachandra Athukolala. But together with that, we discussed South Asian politics, Lumbini as a bond between Nepal and Sri Lanka, and the huge potentials of IT to bring in the younger demographic now. You know, the president is an unelected president because there was a crisis in Sri Lanka just over a year ago and they still haven't had elections. They're probably slated <laughs> for next year. But he seems to be turning the economy around. And it, last year, uh, when I was in Sri Lanka, many people thought the only person who could possibly rescue Sri Lanka would be somebody with Ranil Vikramasinghe's experience and he's a fighter. You know, in 1977, the first reform-oriented government uh, of Sri Lanka under the UNP, the uh, United National Party, the yeah. first reforming nation in South Asia. He was already a cabinet cabinet minister. Yeah. Seven, so that seasoned uh, sort of... Well, um, he's had 50 years in politics, <laughs> so he's obviously the smartest so it, and... When I met him last year... Craftiest it, politician It was a party of one member. That's right. Yeah. And so, you know, it takes some uh, skill and credentials to, to, be, uh, to be trusted by so many to yeah. take an entire country out of this morass. Absolutely. But let me come back to you on Nepal and a couple of questions. You know, in our part of the world, especially in India, caste plays such mm -hmm. a big role, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Um... In your country, you have the caste politics, you have class issues, the rich and the poor. You also have the division between the Terai and the Pahar. Explain that to me. Do you, yeah. I mean, in, your, in the by-election right, right now, in, in which you won of the three seats that you won, Upendra Yadav, who is a big uh, leader of the Madhes, who had lost the previous parliamentary election, came back to win, and he, he's in collision with the RSP. But explain this divide a little bit. Andrew. Jyoti, I think, uh, yeah, I mean... Uh, Caste plays a big, a big role, but Nepal, is, as you know, is sort of a mixture of both the Indo-Aryan races as well as the Mongoloid uh, sort of eth ethnic stock. Right. I think in Nepal, it's the ethnic allegiance that plays a bigger role. So mm -hmm. if you have a Magar candidate or a Gurun candidate or a Newar candidate, you might be tilted a little bit in, in favoring that candidate, irrespective of your ideological beliefs. However, we've gone through these ideological uh, struggles uh, for 70, 80 years. We, you know, whether you are a Nepali Congress or a communist or a non-communist, that ideological identity is also quite important. And in fact, for the last 30 years, that has been the primary uh, source of sort of um, election victories. Mm -hmm. Caste, not so much, except in the Tarai, you know, you tend to say, well, the Yadavs uh, probably, you know, you carry as a block. But even that was demolished this time. C.K. Rauf is not from a Yadav community. He, like the RSP, which made inroads in the Kathmandu Valley, urban areas and the Pahar, in Tarai, it was C.K. Rauf, uh, the, the story. Uh, uh, but he's a very this. separatist. Um, oh, no, no, he's given up all that. Uh, he's given he's, up his yeah, yeah. secession from oh, the uh, Republic. Yeah, he's completely accepted the constitution of Nepal, uh, upholds the territorial integrity of the country, and he's given up his uh, secessionist uh, beliefs many years ago. And this is how people have rewarded him, you know, handsomely. Now he's a rising force in the Tarai, and he defeated Upendra Yadav mm -hmm. in the Mangsir elections, the uh, November... Last November, year parliamentary last elections. Election. Yeah. So Upendra had to come back. Yeah through a by-election. That's right. Uh, so e even in Tarai, where caste allegiances, uh, it's kind of mimicking UP, Bihar kind of politics, uh, that's been weakened substantially, which is amazingly good news for Nepal. But don't you think that, the you know, uh, at one point the Tarai was so much richer than the Bihar? Of course, that story has changed around a lot. And uh, we talk about, in India at least, we continue to talk about the so-called India blockade of 2015, yeah. Yeah. which the Nepali say was inspired by India. Of course, the Indians deny that. But... You know, down the line, eight years down the line, how are yeah. things shaping up? No, the, the contestation then was, you know, you could have uh, wait, you waited eight years to draft this constitution. Why didn't you take the entire country along? Um, there was some uh, grievance in the Tarai, uh, in the Madis, among the Madisi parties and, and the people uh, to make some clauses and provisions uh, more inclusive and all that. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the mainstream political party, I mean, it was passed by 90% of the MPs who were right. members of the Constituent Assembly. They said, well, there are provisions to amend the Constitution within. Let's not, if we wait any longer, this may never happen. You know, there's so many designs uh, against this. Uh, and uh, so that was the push. I myself wish it had, we could have been more patient and taken everybody along. 
So, um, yeah, the blockade, the agitation in Madhya, but all that is now, you know, we've gone through two election cycles since. You think uh, it's settled? It's uh, whatever, it's never settled, right? Uh, it's a work in progress. Uh, but whatever we need to amend and improve, we'll do it through the constitutional process. There are provisions therein where, you know, you, uh, you get the votes, you amend them. Um, the, the richer Karai bit, let me, there are nuances. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, so um, there are eight districts in Madhya's but there are, I think, 20 or 21 districts mm -hmm. along the entire border. There are districts like Rautahat and Mahotari, where there's been a, you know, a beautiful highway running through those districts for 50 years. You know, you'd associate physical development with progress and all that. Yet, in terms of human development index, social progress index, multidimensional poverty uh, index, these districts are behind. In fact, far behind than these remote Himalayan districts like Dolpa, for example. Mm -hmm. right? So there is there is uh, that uh, there is genuine merit to the to the grievances. On the other hand, uh, there are the richest districts are also from the Tara, you know, Parsa yes. and Morong and some of the richest, right? After Kathmandu Valley and Taski, yes. uh, Rupandhi, Bhairava mm -hmm. is, is very rich and it's the proximity to India, it's a trading, entrepot and you know, industrial bases and all that. So it's a varied story and if you dig deeper why uh, Parsa next door is rich and Rautahat is far behind, then the social issues also come into the picture. Maybe it's empowerment of women where they will lag behind, you know, maybe the initial investments have been inadequate and all. So it's a much more nuanced, very differentiated picture. But you feel that the people of the Mathis, which had all these social, and not just economic grievances, although of course that played a very big role, a lot of social grievances as well, is that the Bahun Chetris of the, mm -hmm. of the Pahar, of the mountains, mm -hmm. were refusing to share power. So not Bahun Chetris were in the last 20, 30 years. The Kathmandu Valley, the people came, of the valley. They came out of the sort of democratic struggle. Yeah. So they've done uh, a lot in empowering, you know, uh, fighting against the, the Shaha and the Rana, were not Brahmin Chetri. You know, they ruled Nepal for 200 years, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, so it's a, it's a very, very nuanced picture. Uh, so Bipi, for a person like B.P. Koirala, he, he appointed a Dalit general secretary in 1950s, you know, way ahead of his times, right? And his cabinet, the first woman in cabinet was 1959 in Nepal. Very inclusive, you know, that uh, you know, his cabinet re reflected the Nepali mosaic, mm -hmm. you know, even then. Right? So it's been a pity that politicians after him uh, have not uh, you know, followed in his footsteps. So on the issue of inclusion, uh, there was a genuine grievance, and we're trying to rectify it peacefully through constitutional means, and, uh, and Tara is increasingly getting its fair so Does that mean that uh, parties like yours, smaller parties like yours, will you work together with the ruling party, the Nepali Congress, plus the, the big opposition, UML? Are you willing to work together to resolve the problems? Of no, the we're we're the against parties? them when it comes to issues of corruption and all that. We feel they're, 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 they're really corrupt and inept, right? Uh, and uh, Nepali people are looking for a fresh uh, entry of... Uh, uh, of political forces who are aligned with this new demographic uh, you know, aspiration as well as angst about faster, rapid catch up uh, before climate change uh, gets in the way, before right. our demographic clock sort of ends and all that. So uh, we are uh, for rapid catch up and good governance. And if these other parties also improve suddenly, I don't know how they will, but maybe with a new new uh, generation from within their party coming up, we can align with them on an issue by issue basis, right? but uh, I don't see them as you know, coalition partners. We are actually very afraid that we'll be tainted. We've, our party has been invited to join the government many times, so we've been very cautious in that regard. And the only condition under which we will join the government would be if we get in, influential portfolios where we can show progress at a very short, uh, short uh, period, and people can see the results. Right? We're not going to go to power just for the sake of it, and that's how we differ. Right? We want to prepare, uh, win a handsome mandate. Uh, possibly form a majority government and unleash these reforms in a, in a, in a very short uh, period uh, to show results. But, you know, good governance and banishing corruption or making it, you know, cleaner, if you like, that's hardly an ideology. I mean, we don't know, nobody knows what you really stand for. Uh, no, no, you haven't read our document. I've read your document. You I, I know a lot of your politicians. <laughs> no, no, you, nobody, that, that's what I find, you know, they haven't read our constitution, they haven't read the election manifesto. We are a, you know, social democratic party, a liberal social democratic party. On the right, and, uh, you believe in a free market? The, not at all, not at all. We're very much at the center. So this is the sort of this. This is what our uh, you know folks hostile to us uh, would want to portray. Okay. Um, we do want to be very friendly to the private sector. So this will be a departure, absolutely, because that wealth creation that would be necessary. But given the structural discrimination, the problems that we've gone through as a society, the the state will continue to be uh, very active and invest in a in a viable you know something that we can afford uh, welfare the side the welfare state. But where will that wealth come from? It has to come from the uh, the dynamic private sector wealth creation. So it will be a nice mix. It's a social market economy, if you like, you know, modeled along the Nordic uh, countries, but uh, tailored to our conditions at much right. lower per capita. Right. 
Yes. Well, you have a smaller population, so you can perhaps experiment with that. And energy. already we have the most generous welfare state in South Asia relative to the size of our economy. We spend 4% of our GDP on transfers, social protection. I know India is also doing a lot. But but I thought Sri Lanka was compared to the size of Sri Lanka invested uh, in health and education, primary health and primary education, right. in a way back. So it was known as a very progressive country. Uh, but as a share of the economy, uh, relative to the size of our GDP, we spend a lot. Okay. Talk to me a little bit about the India-Nepal relationship. I know you're running out of time, just a few minutes. The India-Nepal relationship has gone through lots of up and ups and downs. We know the ups. But the downs right now are around this map that the former Prime Minister, K.P. Oli, you know, where parts of Indian territory, we all know that, Libya, Dhura, and the whole Kalapani issue, a part of your map now. How do you resolve that? It's a contested uh, terrain, you know, competing narratives are there, yeah. you know, when, when do you go back to the British days, you know, which map do you refer to, what exactly is the origin of the river Kali. So Nepal took a position based on some historical documents that Libya, Dhura, and you know, that, 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 that whole uh, area. Chutse Naksa, as we call it, that pointed map belongs to Nepal. India uh, has not agreed. So let's settle it on the basis of documents, historical things, has to be through negotiations. And let's let not let's not allow this to disrupt other aspects of this very rich multifaceted dimensions. And India is doing that with uh, you know China, you have, you have a huge border dispute. You had a long-standing border dispute with Bangladesh, but that didn't keep the two countries from engaging constructively in other areas. So that particular dispute, let's settle it through negotiations, experts, historical uh, record. Uh, through the established mechanisms, you know, foreign secretary to foreign secretary mechanisms. Let's get the, you know, maps guy, map guys uh, into the scene. And so there's a very healthy, uh, very constructive way to resolve this and not be too miffed mm -hmm. about what a particular country chose to do at a particular time in history for whatever internal reasons. Okay, so you think that it can be resolved if both put their heads in it? We haven't even started the conversation. Yeah, that's right. So Nepal took a position. Mm -hmm. uh, there was... Uh, unprecedented unanimity in, in Nepal's position. Right. India took a different view, uh, and there's some discrepancy in how the pre-47, post-47 uh, documents and records need to, could be assessed and interpreted. And uh, so let's sit and, uh, and, and uh, go through this. I, I think it can be resolved. So you talked about the India-China relationship, particularly better right now because of Chinese troops amassed on the line of actual control. But it seems as if China, which is uh, a good friend of Nepal's, and your Prime Minister, Mr. Prachan, has just mm -hmm. returned from Beijing and prior, prior to that from India. But the, my question is about Chinese power plants or manufacturing power plants in Nepal. And the Indian government has said that India will not buy power from Nepal if it's manufactured by China. So um, it's a bit of a bind for Nepal. You know, a lot of these power projects, so Nepal has huge potential in hydropower. 80,000 megawatts, uh, how much is it? At least 40,000 commercially viable, theoretically going up to 80, even 100,000 uh, megawatts of clean energy, which can do wonders to displace dirty sources of fuel in India and even Bangladesh. And so the era of climate change, it's a shared global sort of public good and all that. Uh, a lot of our projects are actually funded by private, uh, private capital. The state is only one third now, two third is private capital. And uh, many of these uh, buildings involve international competitive buildings. So the Chinese, uh, for their efficiency, their cloud, their experience, that they've tended to win many of these contracts. And I know there's the whole state uh, sort of subsidies, state facilitation bit. But nonetheless, they've built these power plants. Uh, India, now geopolitics has come into the picture. So the US and India have taken an interest in how China is uh, spreading its influence in, in, in what they regard as their, uh, their uh, Sphere of area of influence. So it's like a South Asian Monroe Doctrine, perhaps. Um, but what we've said is, well, India is free to uh, you know, make its choices. It can say, I will buy from this. I'll... And for Nepal, unfortunately, you know, India is a monopsonist. It's possibly the only buyer we have, right? We can't, uh, the, the you know, really densely populated Chinese uh, clusters are very far. It's economically not viable. Uh, but I think uh, pragmatically, I haven't discussed this uh, in detail, but Nepal also needs a lot of internal uh, energy. So we can, we, uh, all our energy needs will have to be powered through mm -hmm. hydro resources. So if, if there are segments of our production that cannot be exported, let's use them uh, within. within. And and things that can be sent to India, uh, that India will, will buy. That's, so I think, again, they're a pr pragmatic, constructive approach. And in recent years, uh, India has actually become much more engaged in, so in, in our power plants. Um, there are, I think, uh, five or six big projects that have been signed um, uh, to produce almost 4,500 megawatts of energy. Now, mm -hmm. why is that number important? For the last 100 years, we've only produced 3,000 megawatts of mm -hmm. one, and yet there's 4,500 megawatts of energy being produced through Indian uh, state-owned enterprises. The Sutlers, for example, yeah. is doing Arun, 
there's a full court Karnali and all that. And there are big ones uh, like Karnali Chisapani that would even come into the Pancheshwar is still unresolved and all that. But there are four or five that have been during the COVID years and after. Uh, so that's actually a positive sign. And that energy is, um, is destined for India. And uh, Nepa the Nepali cabinet has just a few days ago given permission for Nepal to sell electricity to India. That's, that's another by... very positive development. So, uh, so in, the, in that regard, yes, we will have access to the Bangladeshi market for which there's a big demand for Nepali power. The Bangladeshis have often said, we want to invest in Sumkoshi, for example, 600, 700 megawatt power plant. Uh, but India is uh, between Bangladesh and... Uh, so is India coming in the way or is it being less... Uh, the perception was uh, India was reluctant to facilitate this exchange, direct exchange between Nepal and Bangladesh. But uh, I think uh, India's recent posturing has been more very positive in the sense that they've said, you can do that trade, but do it through our transmission lines. Mm -hmm. And uh, and we can even work towards a trilateral or even a quadrilateral grid uh, you know, in, in that part of South Asia. BBIN, for example. So Bhutan and India already trade. So there's a vibrant bilateral trade there. Nepal and India already trade. Um, and Bangladesh and India already trade. But can we, you know, quadrilateralize all these uh, fairly successful bilateral relationships? But could you do a regional energy market, for example? I think we're headed in that direction, absolutely. So that all the countries of South Asia, you know, whether it's Afghanistan... Even Sri Lanka is now in the, you know, the people are talking about these underground cables, yeah. uh, you know. And, uh, so BBIN, BIMSTEC, there's a lot of action there. But not on the Afghanistan-Pakistan side. Not on this, yeah. So the rest of SARC uh, has been dormant since 2015. So electricity or Bijli, the, the spark that lights up South Asia, do you think that could be a big game changer? It is a game changer. We need all that sort of clean energy to power our economic growth cleanly in an era of climate change, when our Himalayan glaciers are melting, etc. Um, and uh, when countries trade with each other, are economically dependent on each other, it's also less likely that they become hostile to each other, right? There's the McDonald's theory. <laughs> where, so uh, I think uh, we're headed in that direction where, you know, so we're discussing one South Asia, South Asian cooperation, uh, regional solidarity, as well as meaningful progress and results on the ground. And electricity would be that tangible benefit. Even this India-Nepal uh, sort of uh, difficulty in our relationships around 2015. You know. During the earthquake, amazing goodwill because India came in fast. I was in the government at the time and I saw firsthand how that overwhelming support uh, from the Indian government. Then that was followed by a blockade where many Nepalis blame the Indians uh, for it. So again, dipped. But you know what warmed the relationships after that? It was electricity trade. So Talkebar, Muzaffarpur transmission line that were completed. Nepal was used to go through 12, 14, 16 hours of power cuts every day. And suddenly through importing, not exporting Nepali electricity, the import of Indian electricity, voila, the, the thing was gone, blackout was gone. So that. Uh, Nepal is grudgingly, I give credit uh, to, to, to the power of trade. And, uh, and now the narrative is kind of well settled that because of our geological uh, uh, imperative, we have to export our surplus electricity in, during the uh, rainy the monsoon seasons, and we have to import electricity during the dry season. India doesn't have that compulsion. Right. So for us, trade is absolutely necessary. But India is a large market. We can even out its uh, sort of seasonality within. But for Nepal, we have to trade. And that realization, I think, is allowing us to cooperate much more meaningfully. Swarnim Wagle, economist and now politician, thank you so much for speaking to South Asia. Wonderful. <laughs>